Evan Wolfson, welcome to Circle Back. Uh, I have been so excited to talk to you because I remember when I was writing my book uh, about how we can defeat the NRA and hopefully build a safer future with fewer guns. Um, I had a conversation with you that really kind of changed the course uh, of how I was thinking about uh, the advocacy in the gun space. Uh, because I finally felt like I had spoken to someone who uh, established uh, many years ago a long-term goal of marriage equality, uh, ran uh, within obviously a large coalition, uh, a series of campaigns and strategies that achieved that goal and now lives to tell about it. Um, and so I found it, you know, truly very uh, inspirational, but also uh, very helpful uh, in really uh, thinking about how to structure uh, advocacy and strategy on an issue that requires some real long-term planning. Um, and so maybe let's start there for folks who don't know, just kind of give us a bit of the origin story uh, of how you began uh, working uh, in kind of the gay rights space uh, and um, how you uh, back then, and, and I think now, uh, really think about um, staying in the fight uh, on an issue that just requires, you know, years of investment and work. So I began working in gay rights when I graduated law school and moved to New York and began volunteering with Lambda Legal which is one of the preeminent uh, LGBT legal rights organizations, and then one of the very few. This was in the early 1980s. And uh, I began working as a volunteer attorney. During the day, I was doing my day job as a prosecutor. And at night and on weekends, I would write on yellow legal pads, because we didn't have computers or the internet then, uh, briefs for Lambda in a variety of AIDS and gay rights cases. Trans came later, actually. But and, so, and, and then after years as a volunteer doing it pro bono, I, I came on board full time uh, with Lambda as a staff attorney and spent uh, a, a very long period of time, about 12 years working as an attorney there, eventually founding the marriage project to drive the fight for the freedom to marry, and then left Lambda to create freedom to marry the freestanding campaign that partnered with organizations like Lambda and the, and the others in the movement and beyond to, to drive a campaign, to drive a strategy to achieve the goal. But my, my actual involvement really began even before that, because what I usually date my time in the movement to was my experience in law school, when in addition to some activism on campus, I wrote my law school thesis, arguing that we should fight for the freedom to marry. And when I, I was not the first person to think of the idea that gay people should be able to marry. Uh, there had been a wave of cases brought by very brave couples all, all across the country in the early 1970s, in the immediate aftermath of Stonewall. And one of those cases even reached the United States Supreme Court in 1972, which, like all the other courts, rubber stamped the discrimination and said no and threw these couples away. I came along around 10 years later and argued that we should not take that no for an answer and laid out a call to action and a case for the work and a strategy for how we could turn that no into a yes, which then became the next 32 years of work. <laughs> and Evan, what sparked the decision to let me revisit this question that had failed uh, dramatically right in, in the 70s? What pushed you to think, um, you know, maybe there's a different kind of way to, to, to think about the challenge before us? Well, I, I felt the court was wrong, and I believed in the innate fairness and uh, ability to change that most people have, and you don't need every, you just need enough. So one of my rules of activism is it's not about getting every, it's about getting enough. And I believe that we could get enough people to change their hearts and minds and therefore could create a climate in which we could get the courts and other decision makers, elected officials and so on, to change their minds. But to do so would require not only litigation, 
but the multiple methodologies of social change, to use Dr. King's phrase, in, in, a, in synergy. And that strategy of deploying these methodologies in synergy over enough time, which turned out to be 32 years, uh, would allow us to transform this ironclad no into the resounding yes that we achieved this month in 2015. And I should say that when I wrote my paper in law school, uh, we polling showed that only 11% of the American people supported the freedom to marry for gay people. And, and, mo and, and, many, and many gay people themselves did not believe this was something we could have or should have. But by the time we won, we had grown that support from 11% to 63%, and it continues growing every year since the, since the win. Yeah, talk about public persuasion work. Uh, so let me ask you, I want to get into the, the strategies and, and the tactics and kind of how you laid out the, the vision for change. But, you know, I think there's a, a real parallel here. You um, revisited this idea during a period, as you point out, where you were really one of the few voices kind of in the wilderness, right? Um, arguing that this should be a goal that the movement should strive for. We're in a position uh, on this issue now where, you know, our organization is focused on building a future with fewer guns, uh, which I'll tell you, when we first started in 2016, seemed very radical, um, even to say to say publicly. Um, now, I think it's actually gained more acceptance and you see a lot of coverage, particularly after mass shootings, how the problem is that we have too many guns, not this idea that the guns are in the wrong hands, right, which is what we used to say. Um, and uh, so, but in many ways, it still feels like even the notion, even the notion that we would be able to make any kind of substantial progress uh, in passing laws restricting gun access feels very far-fetched, feels quite radical that it's even possible. And so I wanted to kind of poke a little further into your experience of, um, of, of being, you know, one of the few uh, articulating this idea. What kind of pushback uh, did you receive from, from within even the, the gay community, uh, other activists around you, right? Because as, as you know, one of the other pieces that, that we sometimes get is you're pushing too hard, go a lot slower. So there's all of these dynamics. Um, and so I'm very curious to hear how you navigated some of them. So in the early 1980s, when I was writing my paper as a law student and then came to New York as a young activist and began volunteering and working, it was a very, very challenging, difficult and dangerous time to be gay. And there were tremendous pressures on all of us. Not only was our country uh, enduring what at the time was one of the most anti-gay, you know, anti-choice, anti-civil rights, anti-racial justice, anti-equality administrations that we had seen under Ronald Reagan and Republican control of the Senate and uh, ascendancy of so-called moral majority and other uh, religious right-wing groups. Not only were we enduring that, but of course, we were living the early days of the cataclysm of AIDS. And we, we literally, as gay people, particularly young gay men, were feeling, we're seeing our friends dying all around us and feeling terror in the lives we were trying to build under all those pressures. So it was a very challenging time. So as you can imagine, when here comes this young law student saying in the midst of all of this, we should fight for the freedom to marry, something we had just lost in the Supreme Court little more than a decade earlier. There was a lot of resistance, not only in the public at large, 11% only supported it, but, but, but even, as you said, amongst the community itself, and particularly amongst the activist establishment, such as it was, very small and beleaguered as it was, there were really two camps of resistance within the, the movement, within the community. One was... Uh, what you could call an ideological resistance, and the other was a strategic resistance. The first camp consisted of people, many, 
particularly in the activist group, who believe that marriage was not a good goal. We shouldn't, uh, that's not something we should be fighting for. It would be something that would be, that had failed. It was an you know, institution that had failed, people like to say. It was patriarchal, it was oppressive, it had not served the country well, it didn't serve women well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there was another strand of ideological resistance that, even if, even if they didn't agree with all of that, felt that as gay people, we should not be copying non-gay people. We should be def- def- creating our own institutions, our own processes, our own structures. We should uh, not assimilate in the phrase of the time, but we should liberate ourselves. We should reject what existed. So there were these camps of ideological opposition. And I think they were you know, disproportionately represented amongst my friends and colleagues in the small activist world. But they were there and very pronounced. Then there was a whole set of other views whether or not people shared those ideological views on the part of most of my colleagues that were the strategic concerns, the strategic resistance, the idea that marriage would be too difficult. It was too remote a possibility that with the, with the onslaught of AIDS and Reagan and Republican attacks, we had so much else we needed to deal with that the idea that we would prioritize fighting for something so difficult, so potentially dangerous in triggering even more opposition and resistance at a time when we were fighting literally for our lives was a crazy idea. And, you know, again, I disagreed with all of that, but I could totally understand where my friends and colleagues were coming from. And this was the, the, the atmosphere of debate, even within the movement, even within activist circles throughout most of the 1980s. And I would like to say that it was my brilliant paper and persuasion and tenacity and constant nagging that changed everybody's mind. But that isn't what happened. The way we actually changed that disagreement within the movement about what to do and how to proceed and whether to fight for marriage or not came through outside events where 20 years after the first wave of marriage litigation in the, in the early 70s, in the immediate aftermath of Stonewall, another group of couples in a few other states, most notably Hawaii, who may not have known any of this history, who may not have known any of the internal debates of the movement and the philosophy, et cetera, et cetera, but wanted to get married, began demanding marriage. And a few of them went to court. And one of those court cases, the Hawaii court case, opened the door that I had believed was possible and that most other courts had not done. But along 20 years later comes a court that gives us the opportunity. And because of all that nagging and debating and the relationships built and being part of the movement, even as a minority voice, I was then placed to be able to seize that opportunity and to say to my colleagues that no matter what we thought before, no matter the debates, no matter where you were on this resistance before, the earth just moved. We now We now have this opportunity and we have to seize it. And did everyone change their mind? Of course not. But did enough people change their mind? Yes. You know, it's so good to hear that because one of my absolute tenets and what I get so absolutely frustrated about is when people say things to me like, Igor, but like, we definitely don't have 60 votes and we don't have 50 votes to break the filibuster. And it's just not going to happen. Like, why are we fighting? for this? It's just not going to happen. And I say to them something very similar of like, we, it's like, there's this, you know, sexy cynicism in our culture of that we're able to predict exactly what's going to happen, especially folks in DC and New York, you know, have this real clear vision into the future. And to me, if you lived through the election of 2016, if you lived through the years of Trump, if you lived through COVID, how in the world could you believe that you had any ability to predict the future with any degree of great certainty? Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm always of the argument when, when I hear that kind of analysis of just put it aside, we're not going to win anyway, uh, is to say that, well, you're certainly not going to win if you don't fight. But if you put up a fight, you at least have a higher chance um, of, of success. And so, you know, I hadn't thought of it that way that you laid it out in terms of outside events really reshaping uh, the entire, um, uh, the, the debates that you all were having at the time. Right. Well, first of all, I think it's, it's not only outside events. We can, as you rightly said, we can change things. 
it's nothing is foreordained, good or bad. And so we, we can create dynamics, we can lay down building blocks, we can open people's minds, we can lay out a strategy that summons people to action. There are things we can do that are the elements of, of change. And then on top of that, as I always used to say, sometimes you also need to get lucky, but you have to make room for luck. And so you make room for luck by positioning yourself to be ready to seize the wave when it comes, which it may come from an opportunity, from a war, from a, from a story, from a court case. We don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, and, and I'm not saying we should all just sit around waiting for good luck to drop from the sky. But sometimes you do get an opportunity. And if you have put yourself in place to seize it, then you, you, you're in a moment of historical opportunity and change. And so that's, you know, that's, that is the way history works. That's the way we achieve things. Uh, and, and if I had to boil down the, how we succeeded in the transformation from 11% to now, as of last week, 71% support, from having marriage zero places in the world to now having 32 countries, plus all, of course, all 50 states. How did we achieve that? If you had to say it in three words, the three words are hope, clarity, and tenacity. It takes tenacity because transformation, particularly of the big kind that you're talking about, that I'm talking about, you know, that, we, that I support the work you're doing, that takes time. It, it doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen in one battle or one stage or one episode. It takes time. That's just the way history works. So we have to be able to marshal our strength and our resilience and bring people in over the long haul and keep them in at least a critical mass over the long haul. Part of the way you do that is through clarity, clarity in your goal, clarity in your strategy, clarity in the work it will take to achieve the strategy to the goal and laying out the, the, the structures, the vehicles, the programs, and adapting those work plans to what the strategy requires and clarity in the action steps that are needed. What are we inviting people to do so that they can lay down a building block, so that they can begin moving, so that they can have a conversation that persuades others. We won't win in one fell swoop, but we can build, 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 build along the strategy. So we need that tenacity, we need that clarity, but it begins with hope. You have to believe you can win. You have to believe it and you have to convey that belief to others. Cynicism, complacency, despair, surrender. These are all what our opponents would like us to feel so that we have inaction. And what we need is action. And the way to summon people to action is to persuade them, yes, we can. Yes, we can win. It may take time. We may not get there overnight. There may be two steps forward, one step backward, but the story of, for example, the freedom to marry is that change can happen. And for that change to happen, as you argue, you need uh, clarity of strategy, you need clarity of goal, you need to uh, really have an understanding of the vehicles you need in order to, to move forward and, and follow that strategy. But that's not to say uh, that any of those things are singular, right? That movements have uh, different voices uh, that then follow different strategies and sometimes have different goals. Um, that certainly, I think, was true in the marriage movement. It's also true uh, in the gun violence prevention movement. And over the years, our movement, I think, has gotten far uh, broader, uh, both in terms of how we talk about gun violence and how we're inclusive of community gun violence, the everyday interpersonal violence that uh, devastates so many communities across the country. Um, but I also think we are far more diverse as a movement uh, in the kinds of uh, messages that we pursue, the kind of strategies that we pursue. I want to hear you talk a little bit about the importance of that kind of diversity, because I've always believed that a diverse movement that wasn't always following a singular strategy and always on the exact same page um, uh, was really that tension uh, really helped um, move us forward, right? That classic kind of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King dynamic uh, that I think you so need for social change in America. Yeah, well, th the good news for you then is you don't have to worry because there will be that diversity. There will be diversity of opinion, diversity of priorities, diversity of egos, diversity of tactics, because that's the in the nature of a movement. I will often say that in order for us to achieve the kind of transformation we achieved in winning the freedom to marry, we needed four key ingredients. Number one, we needed the Constitution. 
And by the Constitution, I mean both the literal guarantees of our American charter, but also what we're lucky to have as Americans, however fragile and endangered they may be by way of an independent judiciary, a free press, the right to organize, the right to protest, the right to persuade our lawmakers, the right to vote, et cetera. We, we need those bedrock tools to achieve change. But we also know that they don't enforce themselves and not, they're indeed they're endangered and we have to protect them. But even when they're working, you have to make them work. And so under the Constitution, with this system, we still need three other things. And the three other things we needed in order to achieve the transformation under the Constitution were a movement, a strategy and a campaign. By movement, what I mean to say, as you just said, that there were many players, many organizations, many different people with different ideas who may have shared a common general idea of what they wanted, but didn't agree on almost any particularity, and certainly not, in, not unanimously. It took a multiplicity of players doing multiple methodologies, litigation, legislation, direct action, public education, electoral work, fundraising, many, many parts in many states, in many battles over many years. That's a movement. But it wasn't just a random set of swirl either that got us where we needed to go. Alongside the movement, we needed a strategy. We needed, how are we going to achieve what we want to achieve? Once we knew what the goal was, in our case, winning the freedom to marry, how does that happen? How do we make that happen? Now, not everyone who was engaged in the movement and in multiplicity necessarily knew there was a strategy or agreed on the strategy or voted to designate a leader of the strategy. But as long as they were contributing to what the strategy required, they were, they were helping. They were helping move things forward. And to make sure that all came together, we needed that fourth thing, a campaign. The campaign, Freedom to Marry, didn't do all the pieces, didn't do everything. That took a movement. That took the multiplicity. But Freedom to Marry woke up every day with its eyes on the prize of the goal, which was not the only goal of the movement, but it was the goal of the campaign, and figured out how to leverage the movement to drive the strategy and fulfill the strategy to get the goal done. Campaigns need to have clarity of goal and they need to drive strategy and figure out how to enlist a critical mass of allies. Movements in a sense are the ecosystem in which you draw those elements of what's needed and which you can work to enlarge in order to make sure you have the kind of movement and ecosystem you need. But a movement is not going to all agree on anything, nor does it have to, in order for it to be the, the ecosystem in which change happens. Let me ask you to connect all of this to the gun violence prevention movement and just directly uh, uh, kind of um, get your sense of what lessons do you think uh, we can apply to fighting for a future with fewer guns. What lessons from marriage equality from that successful fight uh, do you think are applicable here? Well, I, I mean, some of them, of course, we've touched on already. We don't all have to agree on everything in order to be at least parallel play and pulling in the right direction. So if there's a fertile enough movement and some are trying this and some are trying that, each of those can provide some building blocks that can help the others. And we shouldn't spend our time and energy distraught that we can't get everyone to agree on the one magic bullet thing. As long as there's a critical mass behind each particular strategy, the, the best strategies will eventually prevail. They will drive themselves forward and they will leverage off the gains that others may make. I know there are some who, you know, for example, resist the idea of any of the smaller specific incremental changes because they alone will not solve the problem, which is true. They won't. Others say, well, we need those building blocks and we need to achieve. So we should, we should talk about those. I actually believe in what's called transformational change, which is where you lay out the full vision of what you want. You talk about your goal, you propound it with clarity, and you show the strategy. What is the pathway for getting there? But even transformational change, and I should say transformational change can be distinguished from transactional change, 
which is this idea that you should only ask for exactly what you can get at the moment. You should really just not talk about big vision, not talk about things that might scare people. Just go for the one small thing that somehow you might be able to eke out through the existing. I believe in the former. I believe in transformational change. But even transformational change unfolds transactionally, incrementally, with building blocks in stages over time. So we don't have to argue about this. What we have to do is figure out how to take building blocks whether they come in the big way or in the small way and keep going toward the vision that we put out there. But it is also true that by talking about the larger vision and by painting a picture and tapping into the real values that are at stake with authenticity and compelling stories, public opinion and what becomes attainable and political realities change. And so the transformational vision is to move the country to where we want it to be, but not make that perfect, the enemy of the good of taking each increment, each building block, each ally, each, I can go with you this far today, but not further, take them today and keep going. You know, I was known, of course, as Mr. Marriage and was viewed as the one who was fighting for marriage and arguing for marriage. But I was also one who who didn't say, let's not take partnership. Let's not take civil unions. Let's not take non-discrimination laws. Let's not work on trans. I, I never said any of that because I believe that each of those gains and steps and building blocks, important in their own right, but also useful as steps toward a further vision, could be integrated into the larger work, provided we didn't settle for these things, mm -hmm. provided we didn't say they were enough. And we don't have to declare defeat before we've even begun trying to change people. Talking about there are too many guns today, as you said, might seem radical, less radical today than it did a few years ago, but it will seem less and less radical the more and more you say it. Yeah. Well, Mr. Marriage, let me let me ask you this to, to zoom in maybe a little more specifically. You know, one of the frustrations uh, to me um, in terms of how certainly lawmakers, and I would say even many movement leaders talk about gun violence prevention is that I would argue, and I'm curious where you stand here and how it differs from how folks thought about marriage, that in the gun violence prevention space, there's a real hesitation, I think, or I've found to establish and clearly articulate that long-term goal of what we're fighting for, right? So right now we're, we're recording this conversation as there's a, an effort uh, by a bipartisan group of senators with Senator Murphy leading the Democratic side, Senator Cornyn leading the Republican side to find some common ground, some very small reforms uh, that, that could be achieved in the aftermath of the mass shootings that we just experienced. Um, and you look at the kind of um, uh, coverage these negotiations receive and, and how um, not only do the, do the two key negotiators, but also party leaders talk about this issue. It's always, um, it's, it's always focused on these small little incremental changes, which I, I take your point are necessary uh, to get us towards, towards the larger goal. And I would argue on this issue, actually create a muscle memory that, oh my God, change is possible, right? Lawmakers are able to respond and do things uh, in the aftermath of, of tragedy. I think all of that is important, but I think what I am concerned about is I think voters don't fully understand what it is we're ultimately fighting for because it's almost never articulated as a long-term goal, right? So I say it as building a future with, with fewer guns, which people would argue maybe that's not specific enough. I don't know. Um, and, and that worries me that we, we, we aren't able to uh, transform the 90% of Americans who support background checks and most other gun violence prevention measures, transform that general uh, popular support into specific and direct political pressure because we don't spend a lot of time, I don't think, as a movement organizing our base um, around these kind of larger ideas that aren't like incentivizing states to pass red flag laws, right? Which is kind of the small incremental thing that we're trying to see if we can make progress on now. And what has always struck me is that the other side doesn't have that problem, right? The other side knows 
guns everywhere for everyone is the goal. They're fairly successfully pursuing that goal. Um, but to me, I think it's all, it's just been a failure um, in terms of how uh, Democrats, progressives have thought about this issue, uh, because I would argue that that same kind of hesitancy doesn't extend to uh, reproductive freedom or climate or a whole host of issues where I think there's a, a much stronger sense of kind of what our long term objectives are. Well, I actually think that's that last thing you just said is is not true. I think one of the critiques or at least concerns one could have about other causes we do care about, like reproductive freedom or the or the environment or so on, is exactly that same tension that you're describing, that some are talking big, some are talking small, some are talking about this remedy, but what about that remedy and so on. So I, I do hear that from activists in those particular arenas as well, but put that aside for the moment. I think the point you're making is, uh, is correct that, as we have both said, we should do a better job of articulating what the what the what the endpoint should be. What kind of society do we want to have? What is a safety society? What is a reasonable society that respects rights and in, including the right to walk down the street and not be intimidated and not be at each other's throats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to not be a wash in arms in a way that no other country in the world, you know, there is there's lots to be said, and you you'll say it a lot better than I do. And the fact that there, that may not have been done enough yet doesn't mean it can't be done going forward. And that hence your group and hence the opportunity for others. What I don't think is necessary, though, is to have the concern and the desire to start beefing that up in the way that you you have. Uh, that doesn't mean that you you have to now spend time and energy trying to corral and bang the heads of those who are doing, you know, what, what we might think of as the increments or developing the muscle memory or showing that there's a breakthrough that's possible upon which you can then build uh, and others. And of course, that's the concern of the gun people. They don't, they think any action that's taken will open the door to more action. And I hope that's correct. So my view is don't spend our time within our movement attacking one another for not doing enough or not doing it this way or not doing it that way. You do your thing. Others will do their thing. Over time, that ecosystem will adjust and enlarge possibilities and, and give you building blocks. And upon those building blocks, you may be able to reach higher and encourage more to reach higher. And people may come to see that something they thought was off the table or that they hadn't yet fully thought about now is something we ought to think about. Why do we have to have more guns and people in this country? Why can't we do what other societies like Australia and so on have done? But you don't have to have that argument every minute of every day. And the fact that you're also working to deliver a red flag law or a background check and build on that is not antithetical to that transformational change. So that, that's, that's the critique I would make. It's like, don't, you can, you can take whichever end of that spectrum you want and go with it. And I think that will be a very valuable contribution to the momentum. Uh, the fact that others are doing it somewhat differently need not be the, your primary. No, I take your point. I take your point. You, like everyone else in the country, uh, were certainly horrified by the twin mass shootings we experienced uh, in Buffalo in, in Texas. Um, what was your, I'm just curious to kind of get your uh, tea leaf reading here of because um, the question that we often get and, and I'm sure, you know, you hear a lot is, well, you know, after Newtown, if 20 kids dying didn't do it or here 19 kids dying didn't do it, what is it going to take? Um, and I maybe just want to ask you that in an open ended kind of way uh, to maybe pro prognosticate a, a little bit. And I hate doing this, but, you know, you, you're, you have such experience here of, you know, where are we as a country, given the systemic challenges around this issue um, in terms of getting closer uh, to that future with fewer guns? I hate when activists say it won't happen. We can't do it. It'll never work. We tried and failed. It didn't work after Sandy Hook, so it won't. Why would you ever say that? You always have to say it can happen. We can do it. Why would you let them off the hook? Why would you prescribe inaction to people who are listening to you as opposed to calling, summoning people, including the elected officials, to action? It's never true that it can't happen. So I, I, I think 
absolutely we should just banish that mm -hmm. cynicism i agree let's do it no more sexy cynicism you know it, it it didn't happen after sandy hook and should have and it can happen this time and and we can make it so and there does seem to be momentum and we have to push that momentum and we have to let not not take our feet off the pedal and you know not let them flinch and whatever we achieve we build on it for the next one and the next one and to the last thing you were also saying while this is all pressing and urgent and important and appalling and shameful and the gun control question uh, is so crucial the fate of what happens with this is bound up with the fate of so much else we have to do to reinvigorate and defend and in, expand and build on our democracy to save our republic, et cetera. There are so many other things at play that intersect with this, that it's not only what we do in the gun control space that will determine how we succeed. It's not only what we do around the right to abortion that will succeed how we do. It's not only what we do around LGBT rights, important as all of these and many, many others are. We also are part of evolving opportunities and looming threats and the chance to make a difference collectively. And the one other thing I would say that we haven't touched on really enough in this call is that important as all of these pieces are, and you know, it's not e beware of false either ors. You know, there are a lot of things you, you need to engage and can engage to find success and to build and to move forward. But one of the crucial things that we need to pay attention to is political engagement. We need people to vote. We need to turn out the vote. We need to vote out the obstructionists and those who are autocratic and those who are oligarchic and those who are taking our country and driving it into a ditch. And we have to vote in those who, even if imperfect, will be moving the country in the right direction. And if we vote more in, we will have more to work with. And then we push them and hold their feet to the fire and we build on that. If we had only two more Democrats willing to vote to do the right thing in the Senate, we would be dumping the filibuster, we would be enacting gun control laws, we would be enacting protections for women's right to, to choose, we would be enacting the Equality Act to protect uh, LGBT people against discrimination, we would be enacting voting rights legislation, we would be protecting our elections. Would it be perfect? No. Would there still be a dangerous Supreme Court? Yes. Would there be things we need to keep doing? Of course. But we would be in just such a different place, even if we had two more. Well, go out and get two more. Go out and turn them out. Vote in, vote for Congress. Vote for the state legislatures. Vote, vote, vote. And not just vote, but do all the work that, that gets the vote out there, overcoming the barriers. And the only way to do that is by persuading people that it will make a difference instead of telling them nothing makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, let me let me ask you finally, uh, and thank you uh, for that. I, I felt it's both inspired and hopeful um, uh, to, in closing here, reflect a little bit uh, on your life's work. We're obviously speaking, recording this during Pride Month, um, which I'm sure is is a, is a time of, of reflection for you as well. Uh, of maybe you know a a a message uh, you would send today. Uh, to your younger self, uh, as someone who, you know, was in the trenches uh, for such a long time, uh, you know, because there's, as you point out, and as we've discussed, uh, there's so much uh, despair and steps backwards, right, uh, in, in, the, in the course of, uh, of hopefully running <laughs> towards progress or moving towards progress. And I think oftentimes we, um, we really, uh, you know, lose sight, perhaps, uh, of the large Larger goal and the larger picture because we're so uh, just constantly wrapped in in the troubles and anxieties of the moment. And so, as you reflect, I'm, I'm curious how you would, uh, what kind of guidance and advice uh, you would give to to your younger self. Uh, I, I actually, I'm not sure I, the formulation of to my younger self works so much because I actually think the the most important advice I would give. I actually was pretty good at when I was younger. <laughs> there, 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 there are other life lessons I should have learned when I was younger, but the, the, most, the most important lesson I would give to young people and to all of us today is don't wallow in the negative. 
There is a lot of terrible stuff happening, no question. But we also have made tremendous progress. We also have allies we didn't have before. We have people who want to see the country move in the right direction. We have tools and examples and inspiration and opportunity to make a difference. So don't spend your time cataloging all the bad things. Talk about not the problem, but the pathway. What can you do to make a difference? And don't be immobilized by the fact that any one thing will not do everything. That's what the opponents want you to feel, that you know, nothing will make a difference. You can't achieve it. It all sucks. The parties are all the same. The politicians are terrible. You know, the world is falling apart. Your generation is. Don't don't listen to that. Tune it out. Turn off the TV. Turn, you know, step away from the Internet for a moment and go and do something to make a difference and then build on that. Because every time you do that, you also inspire others to do it. And that's how we achieve change. And the story of the freedom to marry going from 11 percent to 71 percent is that this can happen. Now, did it solve everything? No. Were we ever thinking we were done? No. History doesn't work that way. But history does tell us we can make a difference. And when I say we can make a difference, I mean you can make a difference. Each one of us can make a difference. Give yourself the strength, the hope, the the break if you need it, to believe that you can make a difference and go out and do something and you'll feel a lot better. It, you know, one of the things we, we call it pride, and you know, there is pride in how far we've come. But I also think of it as, you know, joy. It, it is a joy to feel like we have made a difference, to be part of something big, to be making the world better. And even though it's never over and there's always more and, you know, pride and joy come with eye rolling and annoyance, there, is, there still is pride and joy. And, and we should, and our country needs us right now. So we all need to get in there. Evan Wolfson, thank you so much for joining us on Circleback. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Guns Down America.